And there is Violet Dufon. Welcome. Hi, hello everyone. Oh, we can see her here. We can see her here. Um, sometimes you have to sort of lean up and look, but luckily we don't have to do that. Uh, Violet, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. And thank you for programming the phone. Um, we're going to get to uh, questions and comments that, you, that you'll have. I, I want to incorporate your relationship, the sort of artistic relationship with Chad here in a moment. Uh, but I wanted, Violet, to begin with something um, that you and I talked a little bit about on the radio last week. And, and that is why, how important it is for you to, that your films be seen not just here in the West, but in China. Um, and I guess the question is, how do you do that? Cause you've talked about having to draw a fine line. And the thing that occurred to me was, can you show this same film that we just saw tonight as is in China? Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I think it will have to compromise some part. Um, in order for it to be shown in China. And we're still working on it. I spent a whole morning this morning to go through another round of notes um, to um, for the censors in China. So it's, it's, a, it's a hurdle, but we are trying to get through it. One of the things you've talked about um, is that, well, mention why the name of your company is Fish and Bear. Because that might give us a clue for how important this is for you. Yeah, so there's a saying in Chinese um, that you cannot have fish or bear claw at the same time. Um, it's just a way to show that you shouldn't be greedy. But to me, I have been making films about China for the past 20 years, mostly as a producer. And to me, as a filmmaker born and raised from China, even though I live in the US now, it is so crucial for me to um, have my films seen in China. And I've done it in the past, both in China and outside of China. So for me to have both East and West audience, it's crucial to me um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, um, it is, it is I, I think that for people who who knows these two words, they probably will know that this says, these are the two extreme different markets, basically, because, you know, for audience, their understanding of storytelling, the artistic, artistic approach, and also basically the struggles of us to talk about any social issue in China. There's a lot of difficulties to tackle both words and then to reach both audiences. But I stubbornly believe that I have to do that because as a, as a filmmaker from China, I firmly believe that changes happen from within. If I'm just making a film for audience outside of China, then I felt like I don't have my people to hold me accountable and to provide a perspective that's not only interesting to people outside of China, but also crucial for my own people. And I think that is that is so important. Um, and also these are the people who are going to hold me accountable. So for many years, um, and the challenges that we tell stories about China is so obvious there that, you know, for example, the subjects that we film, the stake that they're facing um, is so much higher than than subject from other countries. I wouldn't say that all of other countries, but you know, like the stakes for subjects in China, they can easily lose their job. They can easily lose their freedom. Um, and how do we protect that is one thing. And the other thing is that how can we address an issue in a way that can pass the censor and go through bigger um, uh, audience? Um, I kind of, you know, like, from many films, we kind of came up with this idea of having a more subtle approach, um, more gentle approach and hint and imply the issues in a way that um, 
it can be accepted in China. And still, when people see what's embedded, the rad radical um, perspective, they will still understand. So it's, it takes a lot of delicacy and maneuver, and, and um, we call it a dance. Um, but that's what I'm hoping to do with this film as well. But I also think that because of the, uh, the years of doing this work, I actually embraced that as part of my voice. You know, the nuance, the subtlety, it became part of my voice. And I do believe that it actually is more powerful if we do it right. Um, so, I mean, I didn't choose this by choice, but at the end of the day, I do embrace that as part of my creative voice. I, um, I, I won't speak for all of you, obviously, but I, just my own feeling and my own sense of seeing, I described it before in the introduction this evening as a film, for me anyway, that could be really maddening and frustrating. Um, I'm guessing some of you felt that. Um, the, the kind of mansplaining drove me nuts and the way capitalism, uh, the idea of trying to market this beautiful private thing was frustrating and maddening but one of the things you said to to me last week was that you don't want to give in to these kinds of impressions and stereotypes and it seems like what you're saying is yeah some of this stuff is patronizing and kind of bad but but don't judge is that what you're saying we you, you say a little bit more about that because i think it's an important message i think it's important not to not to simplify the issue. I mean, the issue of what women, why women are trapped still in our places is very complex. It comes from, you know, all different kinds of aspects. It is, you know, like it's very easy to tell a Chinese story to scapegoat the government because they're responsible for everything. But I think the issue here is so much more complex. You know, it's it's coming out from capitalism, you know, how the shift of the society, you know and part of it is the big kind of economic growth in such a rapid way of how capitalism plays a plays a role to really unbalance the gender equality and it's undeniable it's what's happening in china right now and it's also you know the power system there's also thousands of years of cultural and tradition that really is deeply rooted and to me honestly as a chinese woman Yes, I am frustrated also that we're still dealing with all these patriarchal mindset and power dynamics. But also, you know, as a Chinese woman, those are part of culturally part of our DNA. And I actually don't know if I don't have that DNA, who am I? <laughs> you know, am I still Chinese? So, I mean, the constant battle of breaking through that, but also how do we still embrace part of our cultural? Um, and it's all like, it's all tied together. Um, but at the same time, dealing with the vast um, understanding of gender differences, you know, in China, as you can see in the film. Um, Violet, yeah, if so I can interrupt, I, I, you said something on another Q and A we did together that I thought was really powerful, which is you'll notice a lot of the people who are mansplaining actually are never named. Their names are not on the screen, including the new shoe, the former new shoe museum director, who's the guy who says it's all about obedience and resilience. And what was the other one? I can't remember. But it's, it's yes, crazy. acceptance. acceptance you, yeah. you accept your pain. I don't know. Yeah. It just came across really bad, but yeah. she chose to leave the, his name out as so as to say, this isn't about him specifically. This is about it's a global thing we're talking about. I thought that was really an interesting thing you said earlier. Thank yeah, you. Fian the fiance isn't named either. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Chad, so uh, let, let's talk about your collaboration, if you would. Um, I want to key on something that Violet has talked about. And it's your, the first, con now this is the third film you worked on together. Correct. Right. In, Violet has talked about in that initial conversation when you were talking about uh, the music for Hidden Letters, that you asked, should we use Chinese instruments? Should we bring in Chinese instruments? Violet, you said no. So explain why. And can you just talk about <laughs> the give and take? 
you yeah, first I, 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 I think that, you know, this film, when I started it, you know, I, I it, the story happens in China, but I also know that it's a film for all the women, you know, um, that is, lives everywhere in the world because our internal struggle of being a woman um, and the battle we have to fight and the impossible challenges we have to face to fulfill all these roles, it's universal. So, I mean, one thing that to tell a story about the different cultural for audiences outside of my cultural, one of my responsibility is to connect to the audience. And I don't think that should be that should be entirely fall upon the audience. It's our responsibility too. If we can provide a universal access point, entry point for the audience to be resonating, you know, for something that it's not familiar with them. So to me, and you know, because Chad and I know each other very well, to me, music is such an important element to help to connect that. And and Chad is so brilliant in a way that you know, this is the third film we work together. Chad always write from the heart. Chad always write from the emotions. So that to me is so much more important than you know um, representing uh, you know the instrument that from that area because to me that's not the most important thing. In fact, that that might actually create separation or uh, you know exclusion. So yeah, and from from out. my perspective, we have this challenge in the whole film of. Well, we have He Yan Xin who sings, and then later who uh, He sorry Hu Xin also sings, and they're representing themselves like musically. There's no need to add another Gu Jiang or another Chinese instrument to what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. The way they're vocalizing and they're using such beautiful language, and so the challenge for me was how do we take this uh, new Shu singing the chanting. And how do we address that musically? There's times in the film where we chose to just like let the music kind of inhabit its own space. And it's not tonally matching at all what they're singing. And that's intentional. It's just meant to be kind of a feeling and you're supposed to be focusing on the singing. And then there's, you know, the final sequence when we get the handkerchief song, you know, my handkerchief is five feet long implying that every day I'm, I'm crying into my dress essentially, right? Um, and that's the moment when the orchestra finally comes in and actually supports what they're singing musically. And we timed it so that the orchestra would respond to each phrase. And so, and I think that the thrust of that is we've taken a journey to this Jiangyong village in Hunan province, so small and far away for most people on earth, right? And now we've brought it, you know, through Shanghai and all the big cities in China to a global stage. Hmm where now audiences in Salt Lake City are hearing new Shu singing, you know? So I think musically we were trying to find a way to make that universal leap. I also wanted to add, I mean, working with Chad, it's always like, you know, I, I have, we have, we talk about, you know, the ending and how can all these layers come together in a way that for it all come together in a way that's unified, but also elevate, you know, um, the message and the voice and all of all these women's transformation. How do we do that? And it's always like I go to Chad as the first cue of writing the ending, and it's always only one take. And then Chad gave me the cue. I'm like, I think we got the film. <laughs> it's always that piece. It was so crucial, and it's because the music was so powerful, and it came, you know, like it came just very organically, naturally. Of, you know, like. I can visualize the ending sequence of having all these women's faces from all over China. Um, the last of which generation. Yeah. The last face you see in the film is actually Violet's daughter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, she was the star at the Tribeca premiere. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, talk about your connection to to Asia and maybe Asian music. I know you did music studies in Japan and, and, and also in China. We, can you talk about that? Yeah, so, uh, well, I'm from Utah. I served an LDS mission in Japan, which, uh, you know, I learned Japanese and I, I was studying at Harvard and Harvard has a very strong Japanese studies department. And so I took advantage of that and went to, I did my Harvard thesis on Okinawan folk and court music. <laughs> where I went for a summer to Okinawa and studied. And this just opened a lot of doors. And ever since then, I've been working on Asia, a lot of Asia connected projects. I have a chamber music group called Asia America New Music Institute, which takes compose, young composers from around Asia and the US and brings them together on the same stage and trying to create 
dialogue through through music. Um, so actually, I think the way I connected with Violet initially was because of a Sundance connection. And that person happened to know, oh, Chad has done a lot of work in Asia. So maybe maybe he should meet, you know, so and so. And we ended up meeting through through a friend of ours named Kristen Feely, who's one of the Sundance uh, Labs administrators. So, yeah. Uh, how do you describe Violet? How do you describe your um, collaboration, the the relationship, the big sort? I guess the give and take. What, what does he understand about Asia? I guess, or or is it that? Is it just I don't know. I feel, music. I feel like the three films we've done together, while set in Asia, haven't necessarily referred yeah. to like Asian traditions at all. I mean, he, right? Her goal has always been to make make her films universally. You know, the, the film we did before this was called Harbor from the Holocaust, which was a PBS special that told the story of 20,000 Jewish people who fled the Holocaust by getting visas to go live in Shanghai. And so that score was very much a, we had a rabbi from, uh, who is a grandson of someone who had survived in Shanghai sing. We had Yo-Yo Ma play cello because his father grew up in the Shanghai area. And yeah, that score, we did have a Gujang player, which is the, the Chinese zither, but um, it wasn't particularly like, we weren't referencing Chinese folk songs or anything like that. It was, and then the, the first film we did together was called Singing in the Wilderness, which was about a, a Christian choir in Yunnan province in China. And that became like a national sensation. They like went on the version, you know, the, what's that show called? Violet that they went on in Beijing. It's basically the equivalent of like America's Got Talent, but in China. Yeah. And so they all of a sudden were seeing Mamma Mia on national television. Yeah. Like, and these, these are farmers, you know, and it's, it's kind of the same theme of like, you know, watching the, the monolithic capitalist society extract something from one of these tiny villages and throw it on the national stage, you know? Um, But musically, again, it was like, actually that score was very much referencing you know, like medieval Renaissance and Renaissance, like string trios and just like very, very much not what you would expect for like a rural village in China. So we should I, mention, I, go ahead, sorry. I, I think that, you know, like even though these films that we work on together, the approach was different, but I think what Chad, you know, there's something that I think that you just know that it would work um, because of the sensibility, I think, for us that we speak the same sensibility um, cinematic language. And th- that, I think, it's crucial. And it's just like either it works or either it doesn't work. But there's another component of how easy of working with Chad that, you know, like I have been producing for so long. This is actually my second feature that I work on as a director. But, you know, to to allow that space, I mean, it's sort of like in Yushu to have that safe space for people to be vulnerable, for people to really share what they're really thinking. I think that Chad really created that space for me, for me to be okay, to just, you know, like throw out dumb ideas. I mean, I'm like, sorry, I don't know music terms, but like, it's always so easy to work with Chad on that. You definitely <laughs> shut, you shut me down a few times, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to mention if you've seen the 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 terrific documentary American Factory, Chad did the music for that. It's really great. Um, do we are there any questions? I know we've got a, a microphone. I think possibly floating. Around. Yes, we do back there. So, uh, and maybe you can even shout them out if, if if it's too unwieldy to do that. But any questions or comments? Anything for for Violet or for Chad or, over here? Yes, down here. Yeah, just wait for that thing. It's going to be right there. Thank you. Hi, how are you guys doing? Um, sorry, I really, I love the movie. It was amazing. Um, and so what I happened to see was just like, you know, Nushu, it's kind of, you know, it's taken on this new form, especially like now in like the present day versus like from what it was like initially. And now, you know, it's becoming this thing where, you know, of course, unfortunately for like a lot of languages, right, it's kind of uh, lowering in use in just like everyday times, right? Um, and Nushu was originally like this form of like almost like resistance for a lot of women, right? A lot of like solidarity. And I was wondering whether you've seen any other examples of that in present day that maybe Nushu maybe presented to people initially, if that makes sense. It's a great question. Violet, what do you think? Yeah. 
I, I think that you know the importance of having the, the narrative of the commodification of Nushu and the co-opting of Nushu is so crucial because as I mentioned briefly before, that for me, what motivated me to make this film is really experiencing the society in a way that is so shifting when I actually moved back to China in 2010, that when I really felt how capitalism plays a role in terms of unbalancing the gender equality. A couple of examples. One of the most major thing is that we shifted from a country when it has no gender income gap to very you know, huge gender income gap that in 2014, UN even published a really alarming paper saying that this is going too crazy right now of the gender income gap. And one thing it did was the gender income gap, and it's it's not unfamiliar to Western countries, capitalistic countries too, is it really, um, first of all, it comes with a lot of um, discrimination at workplace for women. Secondly, is that it kind of forcing women to go back to serve more traditional roles in their families. And, and for me, I, I am one of those women um, when I moved back to China. And I all of a sudden feeling really confused about it. And also, you know, the society come out from one child policy all of a sudden to really pushing women to have three kids because of our population growth is really going negative now. And, and and there's no support and resources for women to bear more children. So, um, and also because the country is becoming so much more capitalistic, there is a big revival wave of bringing back the traditional culture of, of, of China to kind of like re, re, revive the Chinese DNAs. And as part of that big wave, um, revive the traditional uh, virtues of women is part of that. Unfortunately, as you can see, the princess workshop, it's it's actually not an individual case. It's a part of a large kind of movement. And we were trapped in all of that as women, and for me in particular as well. So that's actually part of the motivation for me to make this film. And also, I mean, I think the, the so ironic parallel of how capitalism is jeopardizing the gender equality on one side and also the commodification is also taking away the last product that women created for themselves, particularly not to have men you know, in, included in this so that they can have their own safe space. And even that is being taken away. I felt like there's a parallel of the ir irony that's going on through the commodification narrative of it. At the same time, these scenes, I think, you know, naturally when we put the camera there, it's just so, vividly captured how man's reaction to new shoe is. And to me, that serves as a bigger context for people to see the, the societal kind of like um, reaction from men, not just to new shoe, but really to women. And this is the society we're still living under. And I was saying this, that, you know, the only difference is we point at the camera there. If we don't, this is the everyday life of women living in China. This is the re reaction that we're facing every day for me too. Um, and this is the context that we're living under. So I am hoping that these scenes can really help people to see the larger kind of context of you know, the situations that we're still living. Um, and I, I don't can think I, can that- I mention Violet, something that um, you were raised by your father <laughs> this was during the, the before the market reforms. This was in the communist time. Your right. mother had the career. Right. Um, was it better in the, the communist times for, for women? I mean, it's alluded to in the, um, the great the film with Simu's great leap like, forward. It was a great leap forward. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. I, I did feel like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of, you know, like improvement in gender equality throughout the time from my mom's generation to my generation. No question about it. But, you know, in some regard, my mom was the first medical um, staff in the family, just like Samu's mom. And she take great pride professionally. And this is not something her mom's generation has enjoyed. Um, and I was largely raised by my dad, who's a musician, because he doesn't have to go to work full time, full, full time every day. Um, but also because coming out from an artist family, he also pushed me really hard to dream as hard as I could. And at that time, 
you know, there's no limit for me to dream. Like, it's no question that I could dream higher than, you know, more than boys and, and all of that. And, and also one other thing I think was so crucial, which was completely taken away is when I was little, when I was just born, there's the state provided free childcare system for all women, because all women are working for state um, owned companies, right? And my mom was working for a hospital, she's a nurse. So I would go to her hospital, which has a nursery um, at when I was 56 days old. So it enabled women to go back to work right away and and but their child childcare is completely taken care of and that's all taken away. So when my daughter was born, the first three years, there's no place for me to send her to. And because I'm I make less, much less than my husband is a filmmaker, you know, I had to, you know, we couldn't afford any, I have to stay at home, you know, and, and that's very much speak to millions of other women. And and I think that. I'm not trying to simplify that things are going backwards, but in a way, because I think when we focus so much on the rapid growth of economy, we didn't focus that much on equality on many different um, things, including gender equality uh, as one thing. So yes, there is definitely a rollback in that kind of regard for um, our gender rights. Yes, there's a question here. Uh, Russell, can you see it? She's the worst possible place for that. That's like a real entity. Yeah, it's possible now, but led you to want to make the film in the beginning, and also with the difficult shooting in China. How did you? Well, look, you hear? I didn't hear. No, sorry. your mic was off. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, what was what got you started on this um talk a little bit about that but also how diff this is a good question how difficult it was to shoot in china um the question is how did i start it yeah well how did you put it what well, yeah 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 what what led you to to want to start this so there's a personal motivation of me making this story um, partially as what I just talked about of, you know, coming out as, as a journalist and also I moved back to China and got married and became a young mother. So all of these things become so personal to me as, as an experience and there's no place to talk about gender equality. Gender inequality is not something you can talk publicly in China about because on the book, it doesn't exist of gender equality and also feminist is still a bad word in China. So, I mean, how can we find a place to really address all these things? And I, I know it's just not me, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of other women who are in the same boat. Um, and also knowing that, you know, like as a Chinese filmmaker, knowing that I wanna make a film about women's rights, I cannot make an under nose film about women's rights because then it will never be seen in China. So how do I do that? And that is when my two producers came to me Mette um, Chan Montikas, who's half Chinese, half Norwegian, and Jing Chen, who has been my longest mentor and one of the best editors in the US. Um, they both came to me and asked me to make a film about Yushu, partially because there is a book that's a New York Times bestseller book about 70 years ago that was published. And I, ironically, I actually read that book when it came out. It's called Snowflower and a Secret Fan. It's a novel book uh, written by Lisa C based on the secret language of Yushu. So they came to me and asked me to make a film about that. And I said, okay, so if there is a way I can tie the history to the contemporary experiences of women today, and that's a film I want to make. So that's that's very much how it got all got started. And also like the other component too is that when I moved back to China after making, you know, made one or two films in the US, I was suddenly went back and connected to the film industry in China, which is very male dominant. And for me to navigate myself as a female filmmaker, and also as a producer, which is a profession that largely the men did not respect at all, you know, it also made me really confused of where I wanna be in my career. Um, I remember when I first moved back and, and Jean was actually there with me in the audience, there's a panel when four male filmmakers were on the stage and there's an audience asking, how come there's no female filmmaker on the stage? And their response is, they just had to work harder to get out here. 
And I remember Jean and I look at each other and I was like, I can't believe this is happening. So from that point on, I made a commitment for, to only produce for first time female Chinese filmmakers. Um, and I have, I have produced seven films and all of my directors are first time female Chinese filmmaker because we didn't have any. Um, and it was really until when this film, when Jean and Meta came to me to this film and Jean has been actually pushing me to direct for a long time. And then she's like, she's like, you're ready. You, you gotta do it. You gotta be on the stage yourself too. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, these are all like, I think when that moment happened, I knew that this is a film I want to make. If there's one film I wanted to direct, this will be the one. Um, and the challenges of making the film in China. Um, well, I felt that actually the, we, we had really good relationship with our subjects. So in that regard, access has been pretty easy for this film. The challenges were, you know, at the beginning, I had this idealistic thought that I'm gonna have all female producing team, which we did have. And I also wanted to have female cinematographer. I wanna have female editor. I wanna have female composer. I, I was like all in this mind. <laughs> and then, I mean, and then I couldn't find any female uh, cinematographers in China that I, I like. So in the end, we work with two male cinematographers and and it was the beginning of me realizing how important it is to include men in the conversation um, from the key creative team. You know, then, you know, like John Fabrother, my editor came in, who's also male, Chad came in, who's also male. And I, I start to realize the value and the importance of having them into this conversation. Um, when my two male um, cinematographers, they're amazing, um, but, you know, for this is a very female gaze film. It's a very female <laughs> Um, perspective film. So how do we, I mean, how, how do we reach on the same page? So we actually came up with this process, which I think is so important. And I think it, it also made this film what it is, is every day when we're on, on set, no matter how many hours we film, I will go back to the hotel and actually came up, the idea is, is, is brought up from my cinematographer. We'll go back to the hotel and my cinematographer and I, we will load the footage on the TV in the hotel room and we'll watch everything. And for each scene, we will talk about, you know, for me, how do I see these things? How do I see these, you know, subjects, especially women's reaction? Why would they react this way? And he would try to come in from the male's perspective of how he sees, you know? So like after days and, you know, like, a few trips, we are completely, I mean, the understanding of us and then coming from both sides. And I think that that's why in the end, you know, when we're, when we're in editing, I remember my cinematographer text me and telling me that he became a father and he just had a daughter, a baby. And then he said they completely changed his way of fathering his daughter because of the process that we went through. So, yeah. Chad, do you want to talk about how you, we're thinking about the themes in this film, even being a part of it as a, as a man. Yeah, well, we had some scenes where we, it was up for debate how feminine we would want to make the music sound versus how masculine. Wow. For example, the, there's the scene after, it's early in the film, but we see this guy in a yellow tank top through the bars. He's kind of suspect. He comes in and then all of a sudden they're, just like hitting on on the women that are trying to do their work and it's really a gross scene and then the, immediately which i think is a brilliant editorial choice you jump into this scene where who sheen is on a stage performing and she's saying everybody wants to see us looking so happy when we're performing but new shoes actually about misery and you see kind of you get a flavor of her misery in that scene because it's just a room full of drunk men you know, basically taking advantage of her beauty and her art's beauty. And like the closing of that scene is her just looking down at her phone and everybody's laughing around her. And the, and the whole scene is done on cellos. It's all, which is typically like a kind of masculine instrument. So that was one scene where we wondered, maybe it's too masculine. And also the very opening of the film, when we see her walking through the fields and you kind of get an introduction to what Nushu is, 
that scene was actually quite hard because in the earlier editions, I had had like kind of lush harps and it just was too like fantasy and too feminine. And in the end, we ended up with something much more spare that just to let her speak for herself and not try to like have the score being in her way or doing something, you know, too strongly one way or the other. So did you talk about the scene where the man w wants Simu to, to, to make it bigger? That was oh, what yes. made the most crazy. I think <laughs> you're doing it <laughs> <bigger. laughs> My favorite scene there is when she looks up and the emperor is there and he's sort of just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think the, the general gist of that scene is like, okay, this is absurd. Yes. Like the men are so far out of touch with what this art form is that it was okay to just go kind of comedy there. And I think we did have versions that were slightly bigger, but it's pretty big. I mean, there's like trumpets and a tuba and, you know, when the panda walks by, it's like, mm -pa, mm -pa. it's doing, it's mimicking him. But uh, it I don't know, was there anything else Violet, that you remember specifically like, Thinking no, I was just, I was just thinking, remembering about masculinity and then the feminine, feminine, um, you know, like contrast. I mean, that that cue of when Hu Jin was on stage and, and, you know, the man was just trying to flirt with her and, you know, toast with her. I felt that it's important the masculinity is there because that's what invaded into that space. And then the music really helps for people to understand of why that space being invaded in such an insensitive way. Basically. Yeah, she's she's kind of like drowning in masculinity in that scene. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't want to get on the bad side of the library, so I'm going to wrap this up. But I, I, the, the big question that keeps coming up is, do you think, what will happen to Nushu, do you think? You, you, you said as long as, as women can gather to confide and listen to each other that at least some form of of it will 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 stay with us i guess but but should it can it in the same way what what do you think i i i think absolutely it can um to me that you know the past of han yushu being commodified is taking its own path and that's not what i care about and i know that there's nobody no nothing that we can control on that that train kind of just like left and then going to like enchanted territories but for me because i mean that past of who is in yushu they they don't care the true legacy of yushu but for me what really fascinated me and what really inspired me in such a profound way of thinking about those women from the feudal society when they're enduring these unbearable physical, emotional, intellectual situations. And, and you know, for them, there's no way for them to imagine the, some, you know, the, the same way as the Western feminism movement, you know, there's no way for them to throw away the system. And they're just like being trapped in the bottom of society, but instead they found a different approach. They basically, by creating their own space and having their own language to share and sharing their own voice, they were able to find a way. I think the starting point is so crucial of starting somewhere that allow them to share their vulnerability because vulnerability is the starting point for us to express our true self. And that's a space for them to allow them to express their true authentic self, their honest self that it's under so much sufferings, um, under so much, you know, um, ways otherwise they would not be able to, to express if it were not such a safe space for them. And with that, it allows these people to connect together and bond in a way that strength and pride and also um, resilience all came out and they were able to move together forward as a collective. And I thought that is so brilliant because in the end of the day, they did shift narrative, you know, like um, one of the things that, you know, in Western world, we describe men with dignity, 
and, and wisdom uh, uh, call them in, you know gentlemen and you know in these territories um, these women have a special term that even men call them gentle women because when they when they know how to practice new shu, they are they were treated with more respect basically and this is because of the power that they created and and the intentional structured sisterhood that allow these women to bond from a young girl all the way till they die and i thought that just like so brilliant in a way that you know look at it where we are today right i mean we have come a long way um you know in the us in particular in western countries of what we have achieved as a woman but at the same time we actually have to fulfill even more roles than before, honestly. You know, like the the definition of whatever the perfect woman is, you know, like now it's adding on so many more things in a way that when we are showcased on the outside of we want to be strong, we want to be perfect, we can do all of those things. It actually suppresses even more internally, I think, you know, for me at least, and I know that for many, many other women, the same thing. So how do we have that kind of safe space to allow us to be vulnerable, to allow us to say that this is more than enough we can handle, you know, and then from that point on, and to have the conversation and also, you know, have that community to, to move the narrative forward. Because, I mean, honestly, if we don't have the sisterhood to change the narrative going forward, we're going backwards. There's no question about it. If we don't keep pushing forward, we're going backwards. So that's why I think that if we can take that legacy of new Shu in every one of our heart and just honor that, honor the true vulnerability that we have as women. And I think that's a starting point of any movement. And that's why along with the film, we're starting an impact campaign. We're actually, um, setting up this virtual gallery and open calls to all women, despite of whether they have artistic background or not, as long as they can choose any kind of art form and express their suppressions, express their own voice and express the power of sisterhood um, through the art and submit to us. It's actually on our website, Hidden Letters. Uh, film.com it only takes 10 minutes to submit and we don't limit any kind of art forms and and no background nothing no skill set required and as long as you submit to us we actually have already received more than 130 submissions and the deadline is uh going to be in a month and after that we're going to curate all these work and we're going to build a virtual galleries and this gallery will be accessible by everybody on their mobile phones they can go into the space and it has different rooms each room will curate 15 to 20 art pieces and each room has a theme from the place of trauma sufferings to the place of you know, how do we reckon our gender identity to the place of resilience, sisterhood, and to a final, you know, spiritual garden that we call. Um, and to have that experience allow us, I think, this space that, you know, like in the virtual space we created, even with this virtual gallery, we hope to make a statement that sisterhood is global. And we have this space, and then this will be the beginning of everything. So, I mean, hopefully people can submit to us um, and then um, stay tuned with our social media because we're gonna announce very soon of uh, our virtual gallery to be, um, th the prototype is already in development. It's looking really amazing. So I'm super excited about it. Yeah, you should be, that's terrific. Violet Devong, thank you so much. Thank you. Chad Kim, thank you very, congratulations to both of you. It's really for watching. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone.